Let's begin with prayer. Father God, I thank you for your amazing grace, for your goodness and truth, for your word, Lord, as it teaches us. And Lord, we do need you to teach us your word, for your word is truthful, faithful, and good. Lord, convict us of our sins, strengthen our walk with you, and let us walk with you faithfully. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness, for how good you are to us. And thank you for your love. May your love shine through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's 2022, right? A new year. And so how many of you keep saying Happy New Year to people? And when does that end, actually? I mean, like, is it the 20th of January or February 1st? <laughs> well, what was happening in 1922? Let's take a look at what was happening in 1922. Uh, Warren G. Harding was president, and Calvin Coolidge was the vice president. As the new year of 1922 began, the Communist Party of China organized, and in attendance was a library assistant and primary school teacher named Mao Zedong. In January of 22, a geological survey indicated that the U.S. had an oil supply for only 20 more years. Ireland and Britain had upheld a treaty that made Ireland a free state within Britain's reign, but Britain still had a firm grip. A new pope was elected named Pius XI. Reader's Digest published its first volume in February. And a mass murderer who murdered women was put to death. Gandhi was imprisoned by the British for civil disobedience. Reparations from World War I were required from Germany and Russia, but Germany's economy was falling apart. By June, the German mark was 385 to 1 U.S. dollar. Britain also maintained control over Palestine and was supported by the League of Nations. Mallory, Somerville, and Norton reached 26,800 feet of Mount Everest. That was the highest at the time that anyone had ever climbed in 1922. There were two major strikes in coal and railroad that ended in September. Alexander Graham Bell died in August. By August, the German mark fell to 2,000 to 1 U.S. dollar, essentially becoming worthless. And by October, the German mark fell to 4,000 to 1 U.S. dollar. The cry from the Germans was, bread first, then reparations. Lillian Gatlin became the first woman to fly across the U.S. from San Francisco to Long Island. It took her 27 hours and 11 minutes, and it covered 2,680 miles. Prohibition entered its second year and would not end until 1933. Well, at the end of October, Benito Mussolini, or El Duce, as he liked to be called, made an ultimatum. Either Italy accepts a bloodless revolution and dictatorship, or fight his army. They should have fought his army. Well, the king at the time of Italy, uh, King Victor Emmanuel of Italy, saw the remnants of the prime minister, and he saw the uh, remnants of the prime minister's government, and with, with the result, with open arms, welcomed Benito Mussolini. Well, by November, Mussolini threatened parliament with disillusion if fascist policy is not followed, and in December, Mussolini threatened the Italian newspapers with censorship, if they kept reporting false information. In November, the Ottoman Empire fell, and, the Turkey, and Turkey formed a new government. And in December, Niels Bohr won the Nobel Prize in physics. Well, as you see, the last 100 years, many of the problems we face are similar to what they faced. The turmoils, the victories, the struggles, the conflicts, the protests, the enduring of problems, the end of nations, the beginning of nations are all here today as it was back then. What we experienced and what we have done is happening today, maybe in a different way, in a different language, and in a different context. But the problems we have, the problems we had, are in many ways still with us. We're destined in many ways to repeat the same life, the same decisions, and the same outcome. The tyranny of the past, the discrimination, the fight for power and, and control plagues and hounds us. The famous quote from George Santana is, those who do not learn history are doomed to repeat it. It's really a cliche of reality since we're doomed to repeat it regardless if we do learn history. If you look at just the 20th century, decade by decade, it's filled with war, rumors of wars, conflicts, control, and of course, great victories of people doing great things. But where can our help come from? Where does our help originate? In the book of Psalms, we read this, I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. From the, Where shall my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Our help must come from beyond us. 
can't come from us. It comes from God. You know, we must look up and see our help. Call out to God for our help. The problem that we have is we first have to realize that we have a problem. And the problem is we don't realize we have a problem. You know, a lot of people will say, well, there's something wrong with the world. We know that there's something wrong, but what do we do about it? And every day someone is touting a new solution, a better path, a new way. But Scripture points out our problem. For example, in Proverbs 16, it says, There is a way in which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. <laughs> in Psalm we read, The fool is said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt and have committed a bundled injustice. There is no one who does good. In Proverbs again, All the ways of man are clean in his own sight, but the Lord weighs the motive. I'm doing pretty good. And God says, well, let me take a look at that. In Proverbs 12, it says, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man is he who listens to counsel. The Bible again warns us and exposes us. In Isaiah 5, it says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Woe to those who are heroes in drinking wine and valiant men in street mixing strong drink who justify the wicked for a bribe and take away the rights of the ones who are in the right. Boy, does that not speak to today. <laughs> we are a people bent on destruction, arrogance, and violence. We live with reckless abandon with any regard to God and His Word. We look to ourselves for help and our salvation from our own ability to reason and think. Our minds are corrupted and our heart is soiled. And Jeremiah the prophet said this, The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? And when he asks that question, who can understand it, he's saying, who can master it? Who can heal the heart? Who can help us out? It cannot be done by us. It's desperately sick and there is no antibiotics. There is no medicine. There's no surgery and no therapy that can be done to heal our dead heart. Because of our condition, our goodness is warped and, and flawed. Isaiah declared in Isaiah 64, For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like filthy garments. Even our good deeds are worthless and useless. Our good deeds. We need a Savior. We need God. We need Christ. So I want us to know and celebrate today. Our help comes from God. Our help comes from God. As we come to Romans, we saw last week Paul's passion and heart. He was obligated to people. As he said there in um, verse 14, I am obligated to both Greeks and barbarians, to the, all people of all the world. He wanted all people of all the world to hear the precious message of the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel, he says, has power to overcome the, unbel the unbelief of people, the sin that holds such a tight grip and exposes the lies of the enemy so eloquently the gospel has power to save the gospel has power to heal and overcome our dead and sick heart the gospel message is available to all who have faith in god believing trusting and having faith in god invites god's righteousness into our hearts and minds it's his righteousness that we need that heals our heart when you read verse 16, 17 of Romans 1, let's read it. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. The righteousness of God is available to you and me, to all the world, because Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, he took your sin and my sin. He paid the penalty of that sin, and he unleashed and invited you to receive his righteousness. Of course, he rose again, defeating death and sin. And so when you receive Christ, you receive his righteousness, and it heals your heart. It heals your dead heart. And so when you read these verses in 16 and 17, we realize this is Paul's thesis statement, if you will. Uh, for the book of Romans. You ever write a paper and you had to write a thesis statement, right? What was the thesis statement? Basically telling you what you're going to write about, okay? And so Paul is telling us what he's going to write about, the gospel. The gospel, he's going to explain, will produce a lifestyle 
the gospel produces a lifestyle. This lifestyle will be totally different from the one that we have and the one that we lived before the gospel. He calls it the new creation, as mentioned by John earlier in St. Corinthians. He calls it the Christ life in Galatians. He calls it maturity in Ephesians. He calls it humility in Philippians. He calls it love in Colossians. He, we are called by the gospel to a different way of thinking, a different way of living, and a different way of seeing. Our help comes from God, and this is where we have to begin. So number one, God's revelation is an invitation, not a threat. Let's take a look at verses 18 through 20. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for, the God, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. You know, when we speak of God's revelation, we're speaking about God having made himself known to you and me. God has made himself known. He has revealed himself. He has invited us to know him. He wants us to be known by him. When God reveals himself, it's an invitation to have a relationship with him. Now, when I was at Crown College and I, when I taught there, I used to teach a class called Christian Doctrine, and which is an overview of all the major doctrines of the Christian faith. And one of the first doctrines that we talked about was revelation, not the book, but revelation, God revealing himself. And there are two types of revelation. There's general and special revelation. General revelation is God revealing himself generally to all people at all times. General revelation is typically found in God's creation. Special revelation is God revealing himself specifically or specially to a specific group of people at a specific, specific time in history. So God revealed himself specifically to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Israel as a nation, the prophets. Special revelation, of course, is finally fully revealed and completed in Christ and in his, and in his written word. Well, most people will recognize that there are God or gods. Religions of the world and knowledge of God are gods who have created the world. Yeah, there's a God, yeah. Don't know who he is, but there's a God. Then there are those who say there are no gods. There's no God, there's no gods. That's an atheist, right? Then there are those who say, well, there could be a God. I just don't know who he is, or I don't really care to know who he is. Those are called agnostics. Then there are those who say, yes, there's a God, but, you know, he created the world, then he left on a vacation, just leaves it all up to us. That's called deism, you know which was quite popular in the 1700s. Then there are those who say there is the God, the living God, who's actively involved in his creation, caring and loving us, and he has specifically revealed himself in Christ. That is a Christian theist. There are false images of God. They say that God is a vengeful God who does not forgive easily, does not want to forgive, and is always looking for ways to punish you. Just, just mess up one time. I'm going to slap him good. It's a false image of God. Then there are those who say, well, God is simply love. You know, just do whatever you want to do. He loves us all. Live your own life with butterflies and bunnies. You know, that's, again, a false image of God. Or God may be like a vending machine in the sky. Just do X, Y, and Z, and you'll get this, that, or the other. Or God only loves a few, and if you're not one of the few, then you're out of luck. He only loves a few. There are false ways to getting to God. Some will say you have to try to please God by being good. Just be good enough, and you'll, God will get, you'll get God's attention, and he'll let you in. You have to work your way to God. Or you just have to say a prayer and then just live your life as you choose. These are all false understandings of God and salvation. Or maybe you have to perform some kind of ritual, seek out some sacred place or river, or do a series of prayers, or, or some other religious act, and then... God will take notice of you. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and life. There is no, um, all who, I just forgot it. <laughs> I'm the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Only in Christ. And when you repent of your sins, when you come to him and confess your sins, when you fall at the knees, fall on your knees before Christ, say, God, forgive me. I'm a sinner. That's the way you come in. That's how he invites you in. And then there's the truth, what God has revealed. The first thing we read in these verses in verse 18 is that God is angry. 
For the wrath of God is revealed. God has made his wrath known to all humanity. He's angry, and for good reason. Now, notice there are two revelations mentioned in 17 and 18. We have the righteousness of God revealed in verse 17, and we have the wrath of God revealed in verse 18. And Paul will go back to the righteousness of God. If you look at 321, it says, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed, has been manifested. So before we can understand the revelation of God's righteousness, we first have to understand our condition, our status, our heart, and our mind. We have to understand what we deserve as people. If God did nothing to save us, to heal us, and help us, we deserve, we all deserve God's wrath. Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 2, Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. By nature, we are children of wrath. Our condition is one that deserves God's wrath, and this condition cannot be healed by us, cannot be helped by us. It cannot be removed by us. It cannot be solved by us, but only in Christ Jesus. When you read verse 18, it's that God's wrath is revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of man of, or all humanity. God is angry at humanity for their sin. Sin brings out God's wrath. Our actions, humanity's actions, are one of righteous, unrighteousness and ungodliness. And what this shows us is, number one, we are all, we are, we are accountable to God. We, you and me, all of us are accountable to God. Now, regardless of belief or non-belief in God, we are all accountable to God. Every human, every person, every person who's ever lived, every person who will live, and every person who's alive today is accountable to God. The reason we're accountable to God is that he's the creator. He created you. You exist because of him. Paul said to the Athenians, for in him we live and move and exist. In Proverbs we read, Sheol and Abaddon lie open before the Lord. How much more are the hearts of men? In Hebrews and there is, there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. All of us are laid bare like an open book. He says, I see everything. I see your heart. I see your intentions. I see your thoughts. I see your motives. That's probably where you go. God, I need your help. <laughs> Don't look at that. Don't look at my mind. Because we're accountable to God, we deserve his wrath for all the unrighteousness is done. But our God does not want to release his wrath upon us. He wants to save us, heal us, and bring us into relationship with him. Uh, First John says it best. This is what John uh, quoted earlier. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He wants to cleanse us. He will cleanse us and forgive us. But you'd have to be honest with God. You have to come to him and say, God, I need your help. The problem, though, with humanity is that it arrogantly ignores the condition of the heart, the state of the soul, and the sins of our actions. Humanity ignores the revelation God has given, the wrath we deserve, and instead justify everything we do, saying, this is just who I am, therefore I'm going to just do it. That is why our help must come from God. God, please help us. There's a reason why we're acting unrighteous and and ungodly. We suppress the truth. So number two, we suppress the truth. We suppress the truth. What does that mean to suppress something? It means we intentionally ignore God's revelation of his character and nature. To suppress means to deliberately forget. I have deliberately forgotten that, God. (laughs) Humanity is intentionally and deliberately forgetting who God is and what he has done. One of the truths we are intentionally and deliberately forgetting is that God has created the heavens and the earth. God is angry for humanity has stubbornly ignored the obvious. God has created. God has revealed. God is actively among us. We stand opposed to his revelation. Psalm 10 says, For the wicked boasts of his heart's desire, and the greedy man curses and spurns the Lord. The wicked in the haughtiness of his countenance does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. I can do whatever I want without any penalty. 
let's take a look at what we're suppressing. God has revealed himself in creation. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. Now, if you go to the average person, you wa walk up to them and say, what do you know about God from creation? You know, some may say, well, I don't know. <laughs> Never really thought about it. And some may be more uh, belligerent and say, yeah, he hasn't revealed himself. Or others may say, yeah, I see clearly the hand of God. But most people, when they look at creation, they have been given a different option to understand how it all got here. We are suppressing that God has revealed himself. From creation, we are able to see his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature. In fact, he made it so clear in his creation that we have no excuse for saying, you didn't tell me. So if we go to God and say, well, you didn't tell me, he says, I told you. You chose not to see it. You deliberately forgot it. You deliberately and intentionally pushed it away. You know, if you look at uh, how you're born, when you're born, you're born into relationships automatically, into a family. You're born driven to have relationships. Where did that come from? Why do we have Now, there may be some people say, oh, I hate all people. I don't want to be near around. <laughs> I'm sure there might be a few. I don't know. But we typically are people who say, I want to be in a relationship in some way with family, with friends, in community. Where did that come from? We know that God is Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, eternally in relationship with Himself. He creates, He creates us what? In to have relationship. That reveals God's character, uh, that He is driven and desires relationship. He desires a relationship with you. And your desires for your relationships to be healthy. We are created to love and we will love, but many times we love the wrong things. Love is the hallmark of relationships. Creation proves God is love. And we forget that. In creation, we see his wisdom and brilliance. We see the machinery he has built, the engine of the universe, the power of the sun, the galaxy and the earth. We see the weather patterns, the water given, the life produced on earth. We see our bodies, the amazing structure of our bodies, the lungs that breathe the air, the blood that courses through our veins, the heart that pumps, the brain that thinks, and the eyes that see. And if a little tiny thing happens to that, boy, do we suffer. We could never create anything as remotely as good or efficient as God has done. God has created. We see the power of God, his almighty power in creation. Stephen Myers is a Colombian grad who for decades has shown the brilliance of creation. He upholds intelligent design as a scientist. Now, I'm not saying he necessarily is a Christian, but he is saying, showing that from creation you can tell intelligence made us. If intelligence didn't make us, then what does that tell us about ourselves? Anyway. He, you know, he has been ridiculed, this Stephen Meyer, because he holds intelligence. He's been ridiculed by the science community. He has shown that DNA, the marvel of creation, the brilliance and wisdom of God, is information. Where do you get information? Intelligence. God has revealed himself. He, God has revealed that he is life. He loves life. He loves the creativity of life. God is life. God is love. God is light. God is holy. Because humanity has suppressed the truth, it means the revelation that God has given to us. We have ignored it. We have forgotten it. We have rejected it. Therefore, it can't be seen. Instead, we say, where is God? Where is his revelation? Instead, we create other gods. Cruel gods exhibiting in the human heart. We create false gods. We create gods with characteristics we want. All power, ruthless, anger, tyrannical, and selfish. His revelation of himself is rejected, but we still... Are, we are still accountable to him. Because humanity has rejected God's revelation, denies nature and his character, humanity will then live contrary to God's character. If we reject his character, we will live contrary to his character. When you do not acknowledge God, what God has done, you reject his word, his way, and his will. That is why we read in John 1, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. That is true today. His presence is here in this world, among us, but the world does not recognize him or acknowledge him. 
is to our detriment or ruin for not acknowledging him. Because our help comes from him. And he desires to give it. Number two, God's revelation is ignored. Verse 21. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations. And their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Now, Bertrand Russell was a British mathematician and philosopher. He was born in 1872, died in 1970. He gave a lecture at the Battersea Town Hall under the auspices of the South London branch of the National Secular Society in March of 1927. The title of his lecture was, Why I Am Not a Christian, and this became a book that was published in 1957. In this lecture, he questions what is called the moral argument for the existence of God. Of course, there's several different arguments about the existence of God, intelligent design being one of them, and the moral argument being another one. C.S. Lewis gave a good example of the moral argument, uh, basically that if you drew a straight line and a crooked line, how would you know the crooked line is crooked? Unless there's a straight line to compare it with, right? And so he, he says, and so how do we know what is good and right, bad or wrong, unless there's a standard upon which we can determine that? And I believe God sets that standard. Now, Bertrand Russell wrote this. For I'm, I am not, for the moment, concerned with whether there's a difference between right and wrong or whether there is not. That is another question. So I have no idea if there is a standard or how we answer that question. Then later on in his lecture, he writes it, or he says this. We ought to stand up and look the world frankly in the face. We ought to make the best we can of the world. And if it's not so good as we wish, after all, it will still be better than those, these others who have made, have made it in all these ages, referring to the Christians. A good world, notice he says the good world, need knowledge, kindliness, and courage. Now, how would he know that? How would he know to define that? How would he understand what is good there? Who is defining that? See, this is suppressing the truth. This is suppressing truth. He does not care between right and wrong, but what is good? It's a, is good not a moral question, a moral thought, a moral argument? Who gets to define good? Let me tell you, we have caused so much damage in this world by defining good. <laughs> but Bertrand does try to define good when he says this. This is a very common theme that you hear today. Science can help us get over this craven fear in which mankind has lived for so many generations. Science can teach us, and I think our hearts can teach us, no longer to look around for imaginary supports, no longer to invent allies in the sky, but rather to look at our, to our own efforts here below to make this world a fit place to live in. You know, it's interesting. That was said in 1927. We had just survived the First World War 10 years prior. World War II was about to begin. In, in, in the 20th century, we killed more people faster at, than any other time in history. And I look at that and go, wow, did, how well did we do? <laughs> and, and we're talking about good. We're talking about suppressing the truth. This is suppressing the truth, what you're hearing. And this is a common thing that you will be tempted to do is to suppress the truth. And this is why you have to pray, God, help me not to suppress the truth. It's a common thing within us. And we say, Lord, I need your help so I know the truth. For you are truth. And we're hearing this same message today. Science can help. There's nothing wrong with science, but when you make it a God, it's a problem. This is what denying what God has done and acknowledging who he is. This is turning a blind eye to God's nature, character, and grace. We are without excuse. We're accountable. But God loves us so much that he says, I don't want you in this state anymore. Because God's revelation ignored, it leads to foolishness. Number one, we become fools. Humanity has become fools. Now, as you read these verses, we see that because we knew God, we know who he is. We know that he is revealed, yet we suppressed it. And because we have suppressed it, we do not honor God, nor do we worship him. This not worshiping God, ignoring his revelation, ignoring his word, ignoring his love, we, his, and ignoring his will, we become foolish. Look at 121. For even though they knew God, they didn't honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculation. 
The word for speculation is translated reason or thoughts. Maybe your translations will say that. It means thought, opinion, or reasoning. Our reasoning is futile. In the past 300 years, we've been touting a mantra, reason will save us. Our reasoning is futile because it's crowding out God and kicking him out. If you go to any kind of an event that talks about or a, a lecture on science, which, you know, they can make a lot of good things out of science. But if you mention God is the creator, boy, it's just it's like the demons come out. Won't even entertain that thought. Our reasoning is futile. Our reasoning is futile because it begins with a lie. Our reasoning is flawed, so our reasoning can't save us. When we begin with the lie that God is not there, we then reason, um, then we realize that our, we are accountable. To, we, we say we're not accountable to Him, and He's not worthy to be acknowledged. The basis of our reasoning is founded on a lie, ignoring God and deliberately forgetting Him. And when you begin with a lie, you will never find the truth. You'll never find the truth. A lie cannot lead you to the truth. It's like today. We are taught to begin with doubt. Doubt what you've been told. Question authority. Doubt is the key to knowledge, but doubt will never lead you to faith. And faith is what saves. Faith in God, that is, faith is not doubt, but certainty. So we begin with certainty. God is. I begin with certainty. God, your creator. God, your Lord. God, you're holy. I'm going to begin there. God is. God is love. God saves. When you begin with truth, you dive deeper into truth. When you begin with lie, a lie, you dive deeper into the lie. Because we begin with a lie, rejecting God's revelation, our reasoning is now flawed and our heart is dark. And what does a dark heart look like? Ephesians mentions this. So this I say, says Paul, and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. A dark heart produces futile reasoning and produces arrogance. Arrogance is a hard heart. A hard heart rejects faith, rejects God, rejects his revelation. A dark heart hates the light. That's what we're told in John 3. Men hate light. Run from the light. They love darkness. That's what we're told in John 3. That's what Jesus said. In Colossians, we're told that God has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and has brought us into the kingdom of his son. We have been set free from darkness. We are trapped by darkness. Darkness runs from the light. We will not seek the light. And as a result, we become fools because wisdom is not found in darkness, but in the light of God. Christ is the light of the world. We have become fools because wisdom is found in God. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Not the fear of science and not the fear of creation, but fear of God. When God is rejected, foolishness reigns. We need God because God, because God is the source of our help. God, please help, our, help us. Our help must come from you. Number three, God's revelation ignored leads to idolatry. Let's look at 22 again. Professing to be wise, they became fools. In exchanging the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. When God created us, he created us to love and worship. If we do not worship and love God, we will worship and love something or someone else. We will create something to love and worship. This is idolatry. In the past, idol idols were consist consisted of images made of wood, stone, or metal. These images were images of animals or a combination of creatures put together sometimes. These idols controlled weather and reproduction. These false gods were fierce and unloving in the ancient times. Idolatry is accepting something of less value and worth than God. Idolatry is captured in what God said to his people, the Jews in Jeremiah, you have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and instead replaced, with a bro replaced me with a broken cistern. Now, what's in a broken cistern? Mud. Would you rather have fresh water or mud? And that's what God is saying. You have rejected the living water and accepted mud. That's idolatry. All broken cisterns could do is hold muddy water. 
Instead of receiving who God is and receiving the revelation of his character, humanity has chosen creatures to worship or things to worship. The image of their God is not even human. It's something else. It's, it's of less value. So number one, idolatry worships what is worthless. When we reject God's revelation, we choose to worship what is worthless. In the garden, when Adam and Eve chose to eat the fruit, it's interesting because it was so unnecessary. What was the lie of the enemy, of the serpent? He says, you will not die, but instead you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, when you read Genesis 1, you look at that, wait a minute, time out here. How were they made? They were made in the image of God. They were like God already. (laughs) What could they possibly gain from eating this fruit and disobeying God? They were like God in that sense, made in the image of God. But I guess to them that was not good enough. So they replaced the living, holy, awesome God for fruit that took everything away. Disobedience. That's what idolatry does. It replaces what is good for something that is worthless. God hates idolatry. There's no image that we can make that would adequately represent him. So he says, don't make an image. Because there's nothing in all creation that is comparable to him. However, he does not want you to make an image of God because you already made something that has his image. You and me, people. (laughs) We are to live on this earth, taking care of this earth as, as as God would. We are to live as he would live on this earth. That's what it says in Ephesians. He says, imitate God. Now, if I say, I'm going to be God, you know, like, ooh, what does that mean? <laughs> All this power, you know. No, he says, love. Imitate me and love. You know, because we get this idea like, ooh, I'm God. I'm the God, you know. And all of a sudden, we take all this power. And then we just see, we start to take. Start to take. And what what does God do? He doesn't take, he gives, because he loves. And so when we hear imitate God, it means love. Love like God. That's the image of God. For he is holy, and his holiness is revealed in his love. We're to live as he would live on this earth. Instead Instead of doing that, though, what have we done? We have exploited each other and the earth. We make things more important than people, and we worship anything that gives us power. We love money, we love things, and we despise each other. We exchange what is good and accept what is bad. We reject what is valuable and accept what is worthless. What idols do you carry? It's time to remove them. As you look at the condition of your heart, at the grace of God, at the love he has for each of of you, don't reject what he has given, but gladly and wonderfully accept his Son, the Lord Jesus. For God can change our hearts and open our eyes to see the true treasure of who God really is. In the power of the Holy Spirit and the beauty of the ugliness of the cross and the strength of the resurrection, God is reaching out today and saying, won't you come home? Won't you come home to me? Because our help comes from God. Let's pray. Father God, Forgive me of my unbelief at times that attacks my heart and my mind and my soul. For you are God. You are true. You are real. You are holy and faithful. Thank you for your love that breaks through my hard heart and my arrogance. And and through Christ you've saved me. I could not do it. My help comes from you. I pray, Lord, now that you would touch each person here, that we would examine our heart, we examine our mind, and we would say, Lord, what is in there? What needs to go? Lord, we want you exalted.